This is going to be a response to Prof. MTH's video, Oh Necessary Sin of Adam. In the video, he responds to the recent NPR piece done on evangelicals who are abandoning the doctrine of monogenism, who are questioning the literal historical existence of Adam and Eve, the first couple from whom the human race descended. They are, of course, rejecting this, or at least questioning this, on the basis of modern science, which heavily, heavily, heavily suggests that we were not all descended from one couple, but instead had multiple kind of pre-anthropoid anthropoid origins. Seemingly harmless, except that it raises a big theological problem. The traditional Christian doctrine, of course, is that Adam was the first man. His sin and guilt, therefore, was inherited by the entire human race, which is why Christ had to come and die because death was a result of his fall. Originally, he was immortal, and the human race would have been immortal. And in so doing, forgive, uh, pardon the sins of the entire human race. If there wasn't an uh, original man from whom we inherited guilt, how can we all be sinful? If we're not all sinful, what is there to be saved from? Why did Christ die? Essentially, it seems to undercut the very foundation of Christianity. Uh, I think Prof is implicitly leveling this charge against Christianity that science has essentially now disproven it. Uh, and interestingly, he's kind of making the same charge in a way as the creationists, who also say that if evolution were true, then Christianity could not possibly exist, and therefore, Christianity, uh, since Christianity is true, evolution cannot be true. And I will admit that for a long time, this problem of how could death come before the fall, how could there be multiple origins to the human race, and there still be one man to contrast, uh, who to come and die and remedy the problems that one man brought us, if indeed there was not one man in the first place. That's what kept me a creationist, to be completely honest with you, for quite a while, because I could not reconcile this. It was this very problem that led Monsignor Charles Pope to write The Problem of Pelagianism in Accepting the Theory of Evolution, where he explains that it is exactly that problem of understanding how original sin is compatible with Adam not existing that prevents Catholics from exactly being free to accept it, or at least that it raises great problems for Catholics accepting it. And in reaction to this, P.Z. Myers wrote a very vituperative and, uh, I think, uncomprehending article really slamming the Monsignor for this. So where do I come down on this? Well, I think you need to look at something called reflective equilibrium to really understand where I'm coming from. Of necessity, I'm going to have to oversimplify uh, to the point of maybe getting it wrong. And normally it's applied to moral judgments, but essentially it's the idea that you have general principles that kind of govern what you think, and then you have specific occasions or examples, and some of them are going to run up against your general principles. Now, of course, this is really uh, a lot of fun when you're talking about moral judgments because it raises a lot of thought experiments. You know, things like, you shouldn't lie, but what about if you're protecting Helen Keller in your basement or something like that? But it can also apply to more general epistemological problems. For example, um, you might think that there's a lot of evidence in favor of the idea that we should really regulate the economy, that the economy left to itself tends towards like disorder and disproportion and crashing and things of this nature. Then you might watch some video put out by the Mises Institute about how in 1920 the government didn't intervene with a crash that was worse often in 1929 and capitalism just naturally took care of itself. Now, you might not be able to immediately deal with that. That would be a problem in your kind of overall scheme. But you would, and then you'd have to either reevaluate your general principles, or you could say, I can't explain that right now, but right now it's a problem I need to deal with, not a refutation of what I maintain. You see, there's the difference. That's equilibrium. You have to maintain this sort of balance between what you think is really well established and a few areas that you sort of need to iron out. And this can also apply to science. In fact, if you ever read The Origin of Species, Darwin often is honest enough to say, you know, this seems to be a problem with my theory. This seems to be a problem with my theory. It might make sense if, in this case, you know, I can maybe explain it this way, but he, he doesn't ultimately say that I can explain them all away. He openly admits the problems, but he says there's so much evidence for it that I found that ultimately I'm going to still go with it and just expect that these theories, the, either these problems with my theory, will end up being ironed out. And to a large extent, he was right. Now, the Christian truth claim is that there is adequate evidence of the truth of its central dogmas to the point where we can have certainty of its truth, so that would be a principal belief for us. Therefore, there'd be a difference between problems for us, that would be something that we need to somehow find a way to reconcile or iron out or be comfortable with having a problem with that wouldn't ultimately refute or significantly damage the central kind of superstructure of our beliefs, and there would be a refutation. Now, I think that finding the body of Jesus would qualify as a refutation as per 
1 Corinthians 15. I do not think, though, that a lot of the things that have been charged against Christianity really are something that we need to sweat a lot over. Because by nature, the way they're going to pose a problem is going to be sort of eph ephemeral. For example, uh, for a long time, there was no belief that the Hittites existed. There just weren't any evidence for the Hittites. The Old Testament is full of references to the Hittites, therefore, the Bible is not true. Well, now it turns out the Hittites have, are incontestably existent. I mean, there's overwhelming evidence, there's whole textbooks about them. So, what were the Christians before the discovery of the Hittites supposed to suspend their belief in Christianity because of this one problem? Were they supposed to realize history, archaeology, it's of necessity, got a lot of gaps in it, and therefore say it's a problem? Perhaps the Hittites were metaphorical, perhaps the Hittite was a Hebrew term, a blanket term for the pagans, something like that, but not really worry about it, you see. And I sort of view uh, a lot of things that are posed by, for example, science as well, as also being of this ephemeral quality. Uh, not in the way that I don't believe in uh, science's truthfulness, necessarily, but that, of necessity, science is constantly changing. It's always tentative. It can't put anything forward as a certainty. In fact, <laughs> I remember listening to Todd Friel on, uh, what was it, Wretched Radio or Way of the Master, whatever it was called, and he was playing a clip where Bill O'Reilly was interviewing an evolutionary scientist, and Todd Friel was pointing out all the equivocations that this evolutionist was making. Well, it seems this way, it might be this way, some of the evidence points this way, and Todd Friel's point was, well, how can you trust evolutionists? They can't even give you a definite claim. They're constantly, you know, kind of equivocating and wavering. Well, that's how science works. It has to be tentative. It has to be um, sort of reserved in how far it wants to go. Uh, that's not a valid accusation against evolution, but conversely, if we have certainty of something, which indeed the Christian claims that we do have certainty of the Bible's truth, and then uh, science puts forward something that's very problematic for it, of necessity, that's going to have less solidity in some sense. It's going to have a less uh, permanence, we think, than things that are more certain. And I think you can find analogies to this elsewhere in history. Take, for example, phrenology, which claimed that basically all human qualities, uh, all a personality could be located in various different parts of the brain. Now today that's recognized as a pseudoscience, but at the time, Combs' book The Constitution of Man, which propounded this, was considered on a par with Darwin's Origin of Species. and uh, equally influential at the time. I mean, in the 19th century, it was a really big deal. I mean, it influenced a lot of science to the point where um, there's a good book on the um, phrenology and the origins of scientific naturalism where it talks about how a lot of people became atheists because of it, because it seemed so effectively to refute Christianity, to refute the doctrine of the soul, to refute the need for uh, moral judgment or perhaps the existence of morality at all. Now again, place yourself in the position of a Christian at the time presented by this theory propounded by the overwhelming majority of scientists that seems to completely refute your beliefs. How do you react to it? Well, there are some Christians who tried to prove that phrenology actually proved the truth of Christianity. Pretty embarrassing. Others simply tried to show that phrenology was at least compatible with Christianity and didn't refute it at all. Nowadays, it all just seems kind of silly and futile because we you know, the phrenology is false. There's no need to deal with its evidences anymore or assume its truth when we're dealing with the problem of science and Christianity. But at the time, it was certainly a big problem, and we're kind of in that situation now with Pelagianism. Now, do I think evolution will be refuted by, like, future scientific discoveries? I don't know. By definition, that's kind of unpredictable. But it might be. It's not a certain claim. Uh, and defenders of it, such as myself, will... That's a central point, that it's just the best possible explanation of the evidence that we currently have. As opposed to, I believe, the certainty that Christianity offers, and certainly that it claims to offer, and those who have accepted it accept that claim as well. So for me, this is a case of a principal belief and a certain problem that doesn't actually quite deal with the heart of it, that needs to just kind of be smoothed out and reconciled. This is, in fact, exactly what Monsignor Pope is talking about, if you actually read the article that he wrote, the letter that he wrote. He says in there that it's a great problem that Adam and Eve wouldn't have existed, but he also rejects any pseudoscientific ways of explaining it, such as a mitochondrial Eve, who a few creationists were peddling a few years back as proof that Eve had been proven to exist. 
It's intellectual honesty. We can't honestly, and I will say, I don't think that the ways of making Genesis into a metaphor that oh, each day represents a thousand years or something like that, those are not honest with what the Book of God says to us. It, to me, it's, it seems clear that it's supposed to be kind of a straightforward reading to it. The Book of Nature poses another problem, and it just seems to me like you have to sort of be intellectually honest, try to find ways of reconciling them, but don't claim that it, you know, they easily fit together or, or eat together or that they necessarily refute each other. Both of those seem uh, to do violence to the facts to me. So that's ultimately what I'm going to come down on. Uh, it's a problem. I have my own theories, but I don't consider it a refutation of Christianity. For what it's worth, I do have a theory about this. And I guess I'll propound it now because it's my video and I'll do what I want. We all know perfectly well that atoms don't look like this. They don't look like electrically charged beach balls. But on the other hand, we kind of can't help but think of them like this. We can't help but visualize them in this way. I think that's also what Genesis is doing. Whatever happened at the origin of the universe and of our world, I don't think we science can even grasp that now. Our current theories will probably be overthrown. And if you ever read a history of geology, you'll see they constantly get overthrown. But God chose to represent it to us in the Genesis account in the only way that everybody ever would easily and readily understand. And that's sort of what it's like. We can't help but think of what happened at the origin of time and the origin of our species in any other way accurately than the way Adam and Eve kind of portray it to us. And this is another point. Just because Adams don't look like this doesn't mean it's inaccurate to think of them this way. We don't really have a choice otherwise. And again, whatever did happen with Adam and Eve, or I should say with the origins of the human race, with the origins of sin, whatever it is, it's not inaccurate to think of it in terms of the Adam and Eve myth. It's, in fact, the only way that all of us could think of it accurately. Now, the Bible does make it pretty clear that it was through one man that sin entered into the world. Now, the Pope did make clear in his 1950 statement uh, affirming that Catholics cannot believe in Pelagianism that Adam can't be a metaphor for all our multiple first parents. But on the other hand, I've sometimes wondered if it couldn't be that once the various humanoid things that had evolved from the preanthropoids that had gained knowledge, that had gained uh, language, that had gained reason, self-consciousness, perhaps got together in some kind of federation that Adam was the one they picked to be their covenantal representative, to be kind of the head of the tribe. Uh, he could, in, in some sense, become their covenantal father, you see. Um, because, of course, there's sort of that connection between eldership, uh, fathership, and leadership yeah, in this old world sort of scenario then his sin, along with Eve, could be the covenantal sin of the rest of the community. And through the Old Testament, I mean, that's a pretty recurring theme. Because of David's sin, Israel is punished. Because of Pharaoh's sin, Egypt is punished. There's that kind of connection between the king as the father of his people, who are the, the nation, that then suffer for his personal sin. There's not that distinction that's present in the modern world. Maybe that's what happened. Um, I don't know. It's a scenario. Kind of makes sense to me, but it's probably wrong. And Pelagianism itself might end up being wrong. For me, I am willing, I'm content with the tension. It's not the first time it's happened, and it's not the first time it'll have blown over. Take care.